Kingdom? Culture? Culture? Yeah. God is. Faithful. Go with us back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. If we can, lower the lights. Please lower the lights. If we can't, we'll do what we can. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, reading from the New King James Version. The word says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put childish things away. Will you look at somebody and say, grow up? Grow up. Grow up. Three weeks, y'all. Three weeks we have been exploring Paul's words in this text. And for three weeks, we've been growing. Will you look at somebody and tell them you're growing? Look at somebody else that needs to hear say you're growing. And I need you guys to understand that you're growing. And I know this because I've spoken to many of you. And I've heard the stories about you stopping yourself from saying and doing the wrong thing. Come on, I listen, I love when I see a hand in the air. I'm just saying, I know you're growing because I've talked to some of you that said, Pastor, I'm so glad that you gave us think before you speak. I, I've talked to you guys this week that have said to me, uh, because last week we talked about um, being disloyal to dysfunction. Will you put it up for me? Dis, disloyal to dysfunction. I, I've spoken to those of you that said in mid stride in doing something that I know is not what I should be doing. I had to pause because now I have the language to contribute to my situation. I had to pause and say, no, I'm not going to continue to be loyal Amen. to dysfunction. When I wanted to cuss somebody out. When, when I found myself in the heat of an argument. And I know exactly what to say to you. Am I the only one? I'll be looking for the button. Do you hear what I'm saying? Oh, 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 you, oh, you want to go there with me? Oh, I got you, right? You, you know exactly what to say to win the argument but lose the war. And I say win the argument and lose the war because you know as well as I do, you might be in an argument with that person. But the war is against the enemy. And the enemy tries to plant some things in your mind to get them to come out of your mouth because the enemy knows, even if you don't know, that power of life and death are in the tongue. And some of us have killed relationships, not with a knife or a gun, but with our words. And so I know you're growing. Tell somebody you're growing. You're growing because you have understood this concept of being disloyal to dysfunction, right? There are a few of you who have had the re revelation that this it's just who I am is no longer sufficient as an excuse for not making the change and transformation that God is intending to bring about through us. And so you have to understand for the success that God has predestined for me, I know that I'm growing because I've been informed of instances in which I challenge myself to think before I speak. And if you'll put that up for those that were not here last week, I gave you this acronym for think before you speak, because some of us have decided that as long as it's true, that's enough of a reason for us to say whatever we want to say. And starting with truth is good, but ending with truth can be a challenge. Because there are some things that don't just come out of your mouth because it's true. Oh, I'm just being real. Real what? Real rude. Real cantankerous, real disrespectful. You got to finish it. Next time somebody, I was just being real. Real what though? Because I can tell you, you weren't being real kind. You weren't being real considerate. And so think, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? That's going to stop a lot of us in our tracks. You got some truth. You think you're going to inspire somebody. You think it's helpful, but is it necessary? Should it be coming from you? Have you established a level of credibility? Do people know you as a person that can give information about this thing and on this level? 
Because then you got to know if it's necessary. Not necessary maybe that I say it. Necessary that it's me that's saying it. You don't think God got nobody else that could get a word through? And then last, is it kind? And so I, I, know, I know that you're growing. Um, but, but here in the text, right, in, in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, he says, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, and when I became a man, I put childish things away. If I can, if I can teach for a moment, will you say teach, pastor? Yeah. If I can teach for a moment, right, um, he says, I put away childish things in my study. I learned that the phrase that he uses in the original Greek is a phrase that is to katargio. And what it means is it means to render a thing useless. It, it means to make the decision that this thing no longer serves me in what it is I'm doing or where I'm going. And so Catargio, right, where, where therefore Paul is really saying to us, when I became a man, when I grew up, I realized that childish talk, childish understanding, and childish thinking was useless in my life. I realized for where I am going, I won't be able to use those tools on my journey. It is here that I think that we must be challenged to review the tools that are in our toolbox. Do you recognize the ways about you that are immature and useless? Or do you think that they're helpful? Do, do, you, do, you, do you find it to be something that you are proud of, that, sh that you know how to fight? Because I remember being a person that was like, <laughs> I was proud of the fact that if you caught me, you caught me on the wrong day, I'm going to catch you on the wrong side. Are you, are you proud of the fact that you are a wordsmith when it comes to profanity? That you can creatively cuss people out. You weave, you weave curse words together like a poet. Do, do those things make you proud? Because the reality is if you are proud of your ability to be a pioneer of dysfunction. If, if you're proud of the fact that everybody around you knows, don't get in an argument with them. <laughs> when you go low, they go to, okay, I'm just, can I be honest? And so I need you guys to understand that if you have not yet looked at some of the tools in your toolbox, and rendered them useless, then you're probably loyal to your dysfunction. You've probably decided that based on your trauma, when you're loyal to dysfunction, you're not thinking about triumph. You're only thinking about trauma. We hold on to these things because, what have, because of what has hurt us. And so we decide that because of the way that people have hurt us in the past, I'm not letting go of my ability to fight. I'm not letting go of my ability to argue. I'm going to continue to do lyrical gymnastics so that I can cuss you up one side and down the other side so that everybody around you and everybody in your family know that I am not the one. You've got to render it useless. You've got to decide that because of where God is taking you to, there are some things that cannot go with you on the journey. See, see, you have to say that what I previously considered a weapon is no longer useful. I have decided that the weapons that I was using because of the level of maturity that God is calling me to, for the level of effectiveness that God is calling me to, the level of service that God wants me to go to, those weapons are useless at this level. That's why Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, and y'all know it well, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down of strongholds. That means that the thing that you thought was going to protect you is able to be pulled down. I don't need to be able to talk foul to you in order to protect myself. 
And so what you thought was a stronghold, what you thought was a construct to be able to protect you from those that meant you harm is actually something that when you decide that I'm no longer fighting in carnality, but I'm fighting in spirituality, I can begin pulling that down to the ground because it seeks to lift itself above what I know about God. And so he says, they're not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. One thing I understand is that if I do not render those weapons useless for where God is taking me, then the weapons will render me useless for the level God is taking me to. Ooh, I hope you can get that. See, if I know that if I don't render the weapon useless, then the fact that I continue to use this tool out of my toolbox, because I continue to weaponize my words, it will render me useless at the level that God is trying to use me. It won't be personal, but if I continue old habits, using old approaches and using old language, it being the old thing will put me away. It will render me useless on the level that God is trying to take me to. And it won't be that God cannot use me at all. It will be that God cannot use me at the level that he desires to use me. It won't be that I'm useless. I'll be able to be used. I must stay at level two for the rest of my life if I continue to use level one tools and weapons. But God has ordained me for level 10. The challenge is if I continue to operate at the maturity of level two, God will say, I'd love to elevate you, but I can't take you to a level that your maturity will not maintain for you. Because what you'll do is make a mess of the mandate. You're going to mess up the mission. And so it won't be if I don't render those weapons useless, they will render me useless for the level he wants to take me to. He'll still be able to use me. He just won't be able to use me in the capacity that he desires to use me. I don't want nobody to walk out of here thinking, yeah, because I'm immature because I have not decided to put down my carnality that God can't use you. He can use you, but there's only so much he can use you for. You don't have to worry about going to all nations. You don't even have to worry about going to all neighborhoods. One of the things that I am constantly thankful for is that when you look around this church, you see people from diverse backgrounds, from diverse places, not extremely common in Genesee County where we are. It's not normal to see people that come from rural and inner city that are urban and suburban all coming together to serve the same God. But it's because we have partnered in this place with people that have decided I'm not going to stay on the level that the enemy is trying to oppress me to but I am willing to accept the maturity that God has for me I'm disloyal to dysfunction I'm thinking before I speak so it gives me the opportunity to speak to different people from different places experiencing different things but serving the same God and so, so Paul is saying our weapons shouldn't be carnal. And, and it won't be that God can't use you at all. He just can't use you for where he wants to. But in order to counter this, can I give you our first point for today? If you take points, point number one is stop stinking thinking. See, I need you guys to understand that stinking thinking is vain imagination. See, stinking thinking can be described as the foul thoughts that hold us back. It is the things that we rationalize and defend that are not in our best interests. See, see, stinking thinking 
is when I don't acknowledge that the weapons I use cannot accompany me to the next level. It's stinking thinking when I don't acknowledge that my biggest mistakes were not the result of other people, but the result of my relapse into childish thinking. Oh, can I give you some examples? Because I want to make sure that it makes sense to you. You ready for this? Ladies, if you in here, say amen. amen. Grown women, grown women, don't catch attitudes. They adjust. Y'all follow me? Grown women don't roll their eyes, roll their necks, roll their tongue. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Grown women don't catch attitudes. They adjust. They figure out how to mature. If the situation isn't what I want it to be, but it's going to be what I make it. <laughs> Ladies, if y'all still with me, say amen. amen. Fellas, if you in here, say amen. amen. One more time, amen. amen. I knew it was more men in here than that. <laughs> Grown men. I love you. It's my girl, Cher. Grown men don't cheat. Grown men don't cheat. They commit. See, it's little boys that need to touch everything. I know y'all mad at me. That's why I got campus safety. I need you to understand it. Grown men don't cheat. They commit. It's little boys that cheat. So if you find yourself in a situation where you stepped outside, it's because you submitted yourself to the relapse of reasoning like a child because a child wants to touch everything that looks good to it and believes they can get away with it. Oh. Fellas, if you don't come back next week, I'll know why. <laughs> Can I help you guys understand that grown people, adults, grown-ups, grown-ups don't get even. Grown-ups get elevated. Because the best revenge you can ever have is the success that you achieve over the obstacles that have been placed in your path. Does that make sense to you? See, I need you to understand that when you're an adult, when you're grown up, you don't get revenge. You get the revelation that if I'm going to be even, then I am actually going to lose. Everything else will tell you that being even, you ever played a game being even? Like when there's a draw, that ain't winning. We two losers, it's not. When I get even, we both lost. But when I get elevated, when I decide that what it is you gave me as an obstacle to my growth is not going to stop me from the direction God is taking me, meaning if you did something that broke my heart, guess what? I'm going to succeed with a broken heart until God heals it. If you broke my confidence, I'm going to succeed with broken confidence until God heals it. What I'm not going to do is I'm not going to go low with you. Because if my focus is on hurting you, then it can't be on helping me. Will you repeat after me? Say stop. stop. Stinking. Stinking. Thinking. Thinking. I need you to understand this. Listen to me. See, we all need to grow up. And, and, and the reason I say grow up is because many of us can admit that there are opportunities that we've ruined because we refuse to put away old tools. B because we refuse to put away tools that were useless at the level that we were on, so the opportunity put us away. The opportunity couldn't use you because of the tools you wanted to continue to use. And so some of us have lost jobs 
not because we weren't good enough, but because we weren't grown enough. Some of us have had failed marriages and relationships, not because you're not good enough, it's because you weren't grown enough. When you make a commitment, you see the commitment through. That means that if there are some challenging things that happen on that road, you figure out how to recover if recovery is possible. And so sometimes it wasn't that you weren't good enough. You just may not have been grown enough. Because being grown up requires a level of humility. Being grown up requires a level of forgiveness. Being grown requires understanding that love covers a multitude of sins and everybody's not gonna do right by you. And so you gotta figure out whether or not you can love. Say, grow up. Grow, grow up. Listen to me. In, in, the, in the text, in the text, Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put childish things away. It's in the times I behaved like a child that cost me the most. Because when I don't put the childish thing away, it'll put me away and I will lose the level God intended to give me. Can I give you this point? I need you to identify its influence. When I say it, I'm referring to the behavior that keeps you behaving like a child. I, I, when I say it, I'm referring to the tool that you keep using that you should not. The tool that is like an anchor dragging you down to a lower level than what God has predestined and called you to. So when I say identify its influence, I'm saying identify the influence of the tool, the behavior, the approach, the mindset that you are using that's keeping you from being able to be who God called you to be. And so it's important to understand, right, that, that, that it can be referring to childish behavior, it can refer to shutting down instead of communicating. It can refer to self-sabotage because I tell myself negative stories about what is happening or what people are doing to me based on the trauma that I experienced. And so now I can't trust anybody. It, 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 it can be whatever is holding me on to the pain of the past instead of embracing the current process. It can be becoming disrespectful when you're upset or offended. It can be you pursuing petty whenever you're provoked. Y'all don't know no petty people. Well, you know one. Pray for me, baby. Pray for me. I told y'all, Petty Kruger. Petty Murphy, Petty LaBelle. I'm working on myself, though. I can't remember the last time I was petty. Listen, you cannot put away what you have not identified. Oh, I hope you can understand this. You can't put it away if you haven't identified it. You're sitting around thinking, I'm good. Cut them. Put them. That's for somebody else. You have to identify it in order to put it away, meaning that you have to be thinking as you're going through a thing. When you get in arguments, how do you behave? When things don't go right on your job, how is it that you behave? When things go wrong, how is it that you think? Because it's going to start there. It's going to start with the way that you're thinking about it. And then the way that you're thinking about it is going to determine how you understand it. And then the way you understand it is going to determine how it is you talk about it. And then the way that you talk about it is going to program the way that you think about it. And the way you think about it, understand. You following me? It's a cycle. And if you don't break the cycle, the cycle will break you. You've got to identify its influence. The behavior that I know that is holding me back, what does it cost me? I need you to take inventory in your own life. What has it cost me to continue to operate in a childish manner? Is anything growing? Am I sowing immaturity and dysfunction and expecting to reap a harvest? 
Have I taken the time to even consider the fact that there's something else influencing me instead of me influencing it? I'm going to give you guys some information in a second about your mind, but I need you guys to understand if you are under the misconception that your mind dictates to you instead of you dictating to your mind, you've got to break that cycle in your life. See, because what I love about what Paul says about the weapons of our warfare is he cracks the code for anybody that's saying, I mean, I don't want to think about that, but I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I don't want, I, that's not what I want to be thinking about. I understand. But Paul makes sure that you understand that you have the power to cast down vain imagination, that you're able to pull those things down, meaning that your mind don't control you. You control your mind. All you've got to do is decide. I'm putting something else in that space. I know what just crept in. I know what the enemy is trying to implant, but because that's not the harvest I'm trying to grow. It can't stay here. Oh, listen. Identify its influence. Listen to me. You've got to decide to think about what it is that you are being cost every time you operate in an old system with an old tool and an old behavior. And, and, and I need you guys to understand, right, that some of us think we can behave in childish ways because we don't think before we speak. And so we're saying what happened instead of what's happening. Yep. What happened? Somebody did something to me. It broke me down. I keep talking about, I keep bringing up the fact that they didn't support me. I keep bringing up the fact that they cheated. I keep bringing up the, back, the fact that they lied, that they betrayed me, that they turned their back on me, that they weren't there when I needed them. I keep talking about what happened instead of acknowledging what's happening. Because I can tell you what's happening. What's happening is the Lord is removing them from my life and my path. What's happening is that I'm changing my circle. What's happening is I'm opening the door for some new people that's going to love me the way that I'm intended to be loved. Ooh, what's happening? You got to stop with what happened. I know, I know there's something about it that is like, well, if I stop talking about what's happened, then they think they got away with it. So what? That's better than sticking yourself every day. You wounding yourself on a regular basis, trying to make them accountable. That ain't never going to be the case. You got to stop talking about what happened. You got to start talking about what's happening. What's happening is God is healing me every day. What's happening is he's renewing a renewed spirit within me every day. What's happening is that old stony heart is becoming a heart of flesh every day. What's happening is I'm learning to love myself if there's nobody else that loves me. What's happening is I'm beginning to build my self-confidence in who I am, not who they wanted me to be. What's I'm talking about what's happening, not what happened. You got to identify his influence. I wasn't supposed to be preaching this hard. Ha! Huh? I love y'all. Listen to me. I, I need you guys to understand, right, that, um, that we keep talking about what's happening. Excuse me. We keep talking about what happened instead of talking about what's happening. And now it's been years and there's been no change in our lives because I've been talking about what happened and been blind to what's happening. And so the pain has paralyzed me. And now I'm unable to make the necessary process progress. Can I caution you? Can I caution you? Can I caution you? Will you write this down? Can I caution you not to be so loyal to the facts that you undermine the truth? <sighs> if it don't mean nothing to nobody but me, I want to caution you not to be so loyal to the facts that you undermine the truth because facts change the truth the truth is consistent the truth stands the test of time sometimes the fact and the truth line up sometimes it does not and so don't be so loyal to the facts what happened that you undermine the truth of what's happening. I'm gonna leave that there because I don't wanna keep pushing it. Listen to me. 
instead of being so loyal to the facts that you undermine the truth. I want, look, I want to I want to reveal these two concepts. And if you do Bible before bear with me, I intend to talk about these Wednesday, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on them today. But I want to I want to I want to share with you two concepts that I was um, exposed to as I was preparing this message. Right. In, in the Bible, um, when when Paul is talking, he says, I spoke like a child, understood like a child, thought as a child. When I became a man, I put childish things away. I learned something. Um, it's a concept that's called Waitaba. And it's an acronym. Waitaba is an acronym. If you put it up, Waitaba is an acronym for what you think about, you bring about. And, 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 and I need you to understand that on a surface level, that's just something that a guy came up with, right? Um, that, that what you think about, you bring about. So whatever it is that you're spending your time, your attention, and your focus on is what begins to manifest in your life. The word declares, Jesus said himself, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. If I'm spending my time, my mind, and my focus on a thing, eventually the thing that my mind is on stores up in my heart What's in my heart comes out of my mouth. What comes out of my mouth becomes my circumstances. Why Tabor says that whatever it is that you think about, you bringing that into fruition. Now, neuroscience, right? If you don't know, minored in psychology, right? My master's is in behavioral science. I need you guys to see this, right? Neurologists, and neuroscience has identified something that is called the reticular activation system, also known as the RAS, R-A-S. You don't come to NTC just to hear the word. You come to NTC to learn something. Reticular activating system, the RAS. What the reticular activating system does is it is a small area of your brain that essentially acts as a filter between your mind and your senses. If I can make it real simple for you, it is what is activated when you purchase a new car or you're considering a new car. Have you ever had the experience that now that you have decided on this car or you're considering this car, you begin seeing that car all over the place? Y'all know what I'm talking about? It's not that because you started thinking about the car, all of a sudden people other people started deciding to buy it. These cars were always around you, but until you began focusing on it, the reticular activating system, which communicates from your mind to your senses, telling your mind what to pay attention to. Y'all following me so far? So the RAS, what it does is, it begins to filter into your senses what it is you should be looking for. So when you say out of your mouth to program your RAS, I'm frustrated. I'm overwhelmed. I'm burning out. Y'all following me? What you are then doing is you are training your RAS to communicate to your senses to look for the things that make you overwhelmed, frustrated, and burned out. The cool thing is, you have the ability. Hey, hey it was a therapist that said that, y'all, just so y'all know. That's the therapist that said to reprogram it. I'm not making this up. There is a hack to the RAS, especially if you start your morning out scripting what things you are grateful for. You will create the framework for your reticular activating system so it communicates to your senses what you should be looking for. So you start your day out. You wake up and you say, 
I am loved by the Lord. I am called and covered. I have an excellent support system. I am thankfully for being gainfully employed. And then your rise will be activated to communicate to your senses. Look for examples that God loves you. Look for the examples that you're both called and covered. Look for examples that you got gainful employment. Because I know some people that work some places I ain't never going to be able to work. Just being honest with you. See, when you take it to that place, I got I to gotta give you this last point, And I promise I'm going to pray us out because I've, I've gone over a little bit. Listen to me. The reticular, the reticular activating system finds information that validates your beliefs. It filters the world through the parameters that you give it. However it is that you tell it that you see the world will be the things that stand out to you in the world. And so the reticular activating system validates your beliefs not just about the world, but about you and about your circumstances. And so I need you guys to, and this is the last point, I need you to understand that it's not just what, it's how. It's not, it's not just what, it's how. See, it isn't just what you think about, it's how you think about it. There is an importance to what I put in my mind, what I allow to consume my time, and what I'm thinking on, but equally, it's important how it is that I frame those things psychologically. And so I have the right to frame my circumstances and experiences in whatever way I choose to. And so I have to decide that I don't pledge my loyalty to dysfunction by saying it is what it is, but instead I begin replacing that statement by it is what I make it. Does that make sense to you? That, that instead of me deciding that life just happens to me, I begin taking ownership and authority for what happens in my life. And so I cannot subscribe to the notion that it is what it is, but it is what I make it. And so, and so therefore I can think about what happened in a way that hurts me or I can think about what happened in a way that helps me. I can think about what happened in a way that wounds me, or I can think about what happened in a way that heals me. If I can give you an example that you're familiar with, in Genesis chapter 50, Joseph looks at his brothers. That didn't, I mean, they didn't do nothing right by this man. And he looks at them and he says, you meant it for evil. Somebody say, but God. but God, but God meant it for good. Yeah, yeah. What he decided is that I would not allow what happened to me to dictate how I saw it. It don't change what happened. It's not that you did. I don't tell myself a lie. Like, yeah, they was just trying to help me out this whole time. Uh-uh. Don't start lying to yourself. You meant it for, I know what you were trying to do. But I also know what God did with it. And I think that there's a few of us in this place that can say, there's some people that meant evil against me. There's some circumstances that meant evil against me. But God was able to use it for my good. Listen, I'm a, come on now. I'm going to have you all stand with me, if you will. I'm going to have you stand with me. Um, We'll, we'll collect the offering right after this, but I, I, I want to make sure that I give someone in this, in this place the opportunity to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Um, because if I'm honest, the ability to reprogram your reticular activating system requires the mind of Christ being also in you. 